All right, so um, another fun-filled day of vector calculus coming. Um, just to give you an idea of where we are and what's going on. So we, we've been talking vector value functions and we pretty much have nailed the foundation of them, right? So we've seen how they work. We know how to differentiate them, how to integrate them. We applied them the last couple of days looking at uh, scientific stuff, right? Looking at physics and how we can use it. So hopefully you're feeling pretty good about them and, and how they work, but we're gonna definitely change gears today. Um, today, we're gonna start looking at multiple integration. And what multiple integration is, is sort of the equivalent of uh, differentiation with like partial derivatives, right? You know how we did partial derivatives where we treated one of the variables as a constant and differentiate with respect to the other. Well, you can integrate the same way, right? You can have a multivariable function that you then integrate with respect to one of the variables. Um, and we're gonna, so we're gonna look at that and then we're gonna go, well, what if we integrate with respect to two different variables or three different variables, what's going on and how does this behave? So what you're gonna see is the same thing, just more, kind of like we, it's sort of a common theme now is that um, it's not really new per se, it's just a newer application. And so, um, uh, but anyway, so we're moving into another chapter. I don't uh, remember off the top of my head what the chapter number is. So, um, but when you're looking in the book, it, it should be pretty clear that it's the chapter called like multiple integration. Um, in the book, we are skipping a chapter because um, in this book, after the vector value functions comes the section on partial derivatives and multivariable function stuff. So we've already done that. I'll probably remind you a little bit today of uh, doing single, you know, uh, multivariable stuff, um, but we're just going to extend onto that. Anyway, so that's where we're going. But before we do that, are there any questions on the homework? Anything um, or anything else we want to chat about from like uh, the class? All right, well, hearing none then, I'm going to go ahead and move myself over to the whiteboard. So I will see you here in just one second. All right, so let's remind ourselves just a little bit about differentiating multivariable functions. All right, so back in the day when you had something like f of x, y equals, let's say, x sine y. So this is a function, more than one variable, x and y. Um, we learned that you could do partial derivatives. Right, and so the notation that we used was one of two types. There was this one, the um, sort of the Leibniz notation, but instead of Ds, we did these little like curvy Ds. Um, and the other way that we would write these is F with a little sub X, telling us that we're differentiating with respect to X. I'm gonna use this second one 90 plus percent of the time. It's less to write, less confusing, less likely to misinterpret this as a regular derivative or whatever, right? Um, so this would be f sub x, right? A partial with respect to x. So how did we do those? What was actually the process for doing that? You took the derivative of the function and you took the derivative of the, of the function with respect to x and you treated any other variable that isn't x as a constant. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the key to this is that any other variable in there, any other letter is constant, right? If you want to think about this as like the slope idea, <clears throat> when you've got a multivariable function, uh, uh, let's just go to two variable function because we can kind of picture that easily. That's a surface in space. Right, so think about like the ground or whatever. Um, that's a surface in space. And when you do partial derivatives, you are looking at a slope, okay? You are looking at a slope, but you're looking at it in the direction of that variable, 
So um, an example I like to use because we're in Tahoe and most of us get outdoors and you know we're hikers and skiers and we know about maps and all that is think of it as north, south, east, and west instead of x and y, right? So x is like an east-west line and um, y is a north-south line. When you actually go and you determine a partial derivative, you're saying if the, in the x you'd be saying, okay, how steep is the mountainside if we go in the east-west line? So if I just start going due west or due east, how steep is it? That's s of x. But if instead I'm standing on the mountainside and I go, okay, I'm going to go due north or due south, that steepness would be the partial with respect to y. Okay, so it's really doing the same thing as a regular derivative. We just have to specify the direction that we're going because now we're in a world where we can go in two different directions, right? We've got x and y. And so you probably also then remember that there are directional derivatives where if I don't want to go due north or due west, but I want to go northwest or something like that, we can still figure out what the slope is in that direction. Um, that's what we call a directional derivative, and that's where we use both partials. Okay, so, um, but it, that was Seamus, right, who was, who was just telling me what we needed to do. We're going to treat everything else as constant. I just want to see what happens when I go in the x direction. All right, so what would the derivative with respect to x be of this function? Sine y. The sine y, right? Because the sine y, <clears throat> if y is a constant, then sine y is a constant. So a constant multiple sticks around, and then the derivative of x is 1. All right, so what about fy? So that one, we would see it as this df dy with the curvy d's, or f sub y. What's that going to be here? All right, cool. Thanks, Ralph. Um, it's going to be x cosine y. Right. So it's going to be the x now is a constant multiple, so it sticks around. And then the derivative of sine of y is cosine of y. So Victor, just be careful with the signs. It's when you integrate sine that you get negative cosine. When you differentiate, you get the positive. All right. So that's how partial derivatives work. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, you probably found them fairly easy, especially in that um, calculus class after you'd been tortured with series and uh, you know power series stuff. And then all of a sudden you get to this and you're like, ah, oh, finally something that's not so tough. We did it opposite. Oh, you did this before you did series? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well then this was a piece of I never of even learned about these. And then you hit the buzzsaw. Uh-oh, you didn't learn about these, Jordan? No. Well, Hopefully you're going to pick them up pretty fast because they're not that bad. It's just a matter of remembering that everything else is treated as a constant. So you really just want to key in on your one variable and think about what happens with it. Um, and, you know, make sure that you still do, you know, product rule and quotient rule and all the other things. Um, but none of the rules are different. Nothing changes in how we differentiate other than the fact that we keep the one constant. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I think I just tried to breathe in while I was trying to swallow. Um, but my recommendation, Jordan, if, uh, like you're saying, you've never, you never learned those or anything, um, go back the one chapter in our textbook. So I, I think it's chapter 12, but I, I don't remember the number exactly. But go back to that one and just kind of take a look at it, see if it makes sense. And if it doesn't, come find me during an office hour and we can chat about it and I can try to help get you back up to speed if you're having a little trouble. But most people don't have too much trouble. But you can hear me again? Anyway, um...
So partial derivatives work this way. So then the question is, what about like a partial integral? Can we do this backwards? And the answer is absolutely yes. And it's done exactly the same way. All right, so if we're gonna do a partial integral, it's exactly the same idea. We're gonna treat all other variables as constants. So no different, it's exactly the same idea. So let me show you an example. So you know how to do an integral and you know what to expect. So we would see something like the integral of, let's say we've got x cosine y. And this isn't complete, right? What's missing out of this integral that should be there, just period? A dx or dy? Yeah, we need to have the little differential telling us which variable we're integrating with respect to. And when we have multivariable functions, this is supremely important, right? When you first learn integration and, you know, there was a, a you know, maybe you, you did a homework assignment or something for Larry and, or on an exam and you forgot to write your little DX. And he probably took points off for it because I know I do that. And then you probably go, God, he's being really nitpicky. He knows I'm doing an integral. Why does it need to be there? Well, it needs to be there now because if we've got multivariable functions, I'm going to get a different answer whether I integrate with respect to x or with respect to y, right? They're not the same. So it's super important to have that differential. So like in this case, this is telling me x is my variable. X is the variable that I care about. So the other one, in this case, the Y, I'm going to treat it like a constant. So if I were to treat that as a constant, that cosine of Y is going to just stick around. But then I integrate X. Well, the integral of X is X squared over 2. And so this is the function whose derivative is x cosine y when we differentiate it with respect to x. So same kind of idea as partial derivatives, partial integrals, we're going to keep the other variables constant. But there's something else I'm missing here. Constant. Plus C. OK, got to have my constant, right? But here's the difference. This is where it does get different. This is not just a constant anymore. It's not just four, two, whatever. It's actually a function of y. Oh, OK, why? Why did that just happen? Because it can't be a function of x, obviously. Right, there so. can't be any x's, that's for sure. So might as well be y. Why do I now have to allow for y's, though? Why isn't it just plain old constant? OK, so Victor, just because it's a multivariable function. And think about when you differentiate partial derivatives, you treat the other variable as a constant. And so if we're doing the same thing integrating, that other variable is still a constant. Like, think about this. What if I asked you, differentiate with respect to x, the function x squared over 2 cosine y plus <clears throat> e to the y minus natural log of y. OK, so I want you to differentiate that with respect to x. What do you get? X cosine y plus ey minus ln y. I liked how that started. Plus zero. You're going to get x oh, yeah, cosine plus zero, y yeah. plus nothing else, because these all went to zero because we were differentiating with respect to x. 
right? So again, and I chose this one specifically because we integrated x cosine y with respect to x. And notice that we have the piece that we expected, but then this remaining stuff, there can be all kinds of extra stuff there, as long as it's only in terms of the other variable. So this is the first real wrinkle when it comes to partial integration, is that that constant that we add on is gonna be a function of y, or sorry, a function of the other variables. Let's just do it that way because we're not always integrating with respect to x. All right, so let's do the same one, but let's swap it <clears throat> so that we're integrating with respect to y. So we've got the integral of x cosine of y dy. What's that going to give you? Negative sine y. All right, so let's not forget that x is going to be there because it's a constant. It's the other variable, so it's going to stay. So then when we integrate cosine, that's where the sine is going to come in. Turns out it's just positive. When we integrate cosine, we get a positive sign. So we're going to get x sine y, but this time our constant function is actually a function of x. I can add on anything that's only x's, and that'll be fine. So watch out for that, that when you add on the constant, that that constant can actually be a function of anything that's not the variable that we're dealing with. On the homework, do you think it's going to write the plus c of x like that? Like that's the syntax it's going to want? I, have, I don't even know if the homework is going to have you just do this. Okay. Is, I just honestly, we don't usually just do one partial integral. We usually combine this with another integral. And then it doesn't matter the, the constant is dealt with. So you, you'll see that later. Um, so I doubt the homework is going to ask you for a specific syntax, but for me on a quiz or exam, yeah, I'm going to want you to write it like that. All right, so at least this is how we deal with indefinite partial integrals, right? But we could also have definite integrals where we have bounds. And the good news is, well, we're going to do it the exact same way we did before, like with the fundamental theorem, where we find the antiderivative and we plug in the bounds. Um, but there is, again, a wrinkle. There's always a wrinkle when it's slightly different, right? Um, but for this one, we do a definite partial integral. So again, let's just say we've got uh, some function of x and y that we're integrating. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just put here a dx so that I've got something here. Now, you're used to right, a and b, and you think of those a and b's as constants. OK, well, they still are going to be constants, but they're going to be constants with respect to this variable. So that means they could potentially have y values. So what we're actually going to have here are functions of y that are our bounds. And similarly, if we were doing the integral, let me just change it to a g just for the sake of having it. It's a different letter. But these are dy's. Then these constants they're actually going to be functions of x, or potentially functions of x. And that's because they are constant relative to this variable. So what's going to happen, and, and this is going to be a little weird. You're, you're not going to like this at first because it just it feels wrong. But you're going to see things that look like this. The integral from x to x squared of 
y e to the x plus y dy. And this is a perfectly fine, perfectly appropriate integral, even though there are now variables as bounds. Because while there are variables, they're constant with respect to the um, variable with which the integration is occurring. So it, it feels wrong. I know it feels wrong. Because the only, ever time, only other time you ever saw a variable in a bound of an integration was when we were like creating some sort of a function from it, right? Like just go back to when we were doing like parameterization with arc length and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, it's like, no, those have to be numbers. Well, they don't have to be numbers. They have to be constants. And constants in this case means they could still be functions of the other variable. But we're going to do this the way we normally would, right? So think about integrating this. The y e to the x, the e to the x is going to be a constant, or is a constant. So it's going to be a constant multiple that sticks there. The y becomes y squared over 2. And then when we go to the y, integrating that, well, that's just like normal. That's just y squared over 2. But now we're going to plug in x squared and x. So if we use the fundamental theorem, plugging in the x squared gives me e to the x times x to the fourth over 2 plus x to the fourth over 2. Plugging in the x gives me e to the x times x squared over 2 plus x squared over 2. And then I subtract it. So the process is identical. It's just now we're putting in functions of the other variable. All right. So how are we feeling about this? Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm getting a, quite a few thumbs up, and I got the Eh. eh, but uh, I also like Seamus is uh, we'll get there. I'm optimistic. Okay, so yeah, I know for some of you, this like this is the very first time you see. Well, for all of you, it should be the first time you've seen a partial integral. And clearly, uh, I I don't know if Jordan's the only one who hasn't seen partial derivatives. This idea of keeping all the other variables as constants might be a little bit odd. But uh, the more you do it, the the more comfortable it's going to be for sure. I'm just curious as to how we're supposed to get like numerical values for like finding cur um, a surface area or something. Or well, area. that's because we, well, we don't use partial integrals to do that. Um, okay. Partial integrals are a step along the way to finding the kind of integrals that will give us things like you're talking about, like surface area or other stuff that we want to add up. Okay, so th this is one of those, it's a necessary first step that by itself doesn't really mean much. Right. Um, so then there was also the question, Victor just put in the chat box, um, what does this mean in the geometric world? Right, like a, a partial derivative is a slope in just that one direction. Okay, so if you think about like an integral, what an integral would say is, well, it's the area, right? Or area is not always the best way because it's really what we're doing is we're adding up. Um, and so we are, we're adding up this function in the y direction. And when we have bounds like this, it's specifying an interval on the y, but that interval on the y is varying depending upon where we are, right? x to x squared changes. If x is 1, it's from 1 to 1. If x is 2, it's from 2 to 4. x is 3, it's 3 to 9, and so on. Um, so geometrically, this isn't really very useful. 
Like, there is no, at least I can't think of a good way of describing geometrically what's going on. Um, really, we just want to, we need to know that we're going to use this to do these other kinds of integrals that then will uh, allow us to get geometric values that we want. So let me just go there. Let me show you where we would use one of these partial integrals. And this is with what we call iterated integrals. So do you remember what iteration is, iterating, what that means? Okay, so going through something. Yeah, it, iteration, when we have an iteration, oh, there we go, like in a loop. And that, that's, that's the key. Iterated integrals, iterated anything. We say we're going to go through iterations. It's we're repeating the process, right? Um, you see this a lot in computer programming when you talk about um, having some sort of a process that you're iterating, so you're just kind of going through it. Um, think back to when you did power series. Um, the iterations were finding the constant term, then the x term, then the x squared term, then the x cubed term, right? And you just keep going the same process over and over and over. Those are iterations. So iterated integrals are integrals that are done one after the next. All right, so for example, this would be a double integral. So this is the smallest kind of iterated integral. So we have a double integral. Let me put in a function here. So we've got a multivariable function that we're integrating twice, which of course means we also have to have two differentials. The two differentials telling us which variables we're integrating with respect to. It's kind of like when you did partials, and remember you could do something like f sub xy, and this told you start by differentiating with respect to x, then differentiate with respect to y. We have to have the same sort of thing, right? We have to have the same sort of thing telling us, all right, when I do this integral, the first time I integrate, what do I integrate with respect to? After that first one, what do I integrate with respect to? Okay, so we're going to put them back here. So, for example, we could have, say, dy dx. You could have dx dy. Um, you never can have the same variable twice. I'll explain why. So, you couldn't have, like, dy dy or dx dx. You'll see why in a second. Um, but we also always have to show which two variables we're going to integrate with respect to. So like that would be a double integral. You throw in another one, it's a triple integral. And you don't know how hard it was for me to not write this like tripel, like a Belgian tripel fail. That's when you know that your like obsession is starting to become more of a problem, let's say. Again, most of you know I've got a crazy obsession with high quality root beers, so especially the, the Belgian kinds. But, um, anyway, so now we're going to have, uh, it's going to be a function of at least three variables. So we'll just do one of three. But again, we'd have to say, all right, we're going to integrate, let's say, dz, dx, dy. All right, so that would be a triple integral and so on and so forth. You can have as many of these as you have variables in your multivariable function. And of course, the number of variables in your multivariable function, there is no end, right? It's gonna be as many as you need for your specific process. All right, so this is what they look like, okay? It's gonna be, and you'll always have the number of integral symbols as number of times you're integrating, 
So that way you'll always know. You can just look at it and go, oh, I'm doing a double integral, or ooh, this is a triple integral. Um, I will be honest with you, it's rare that you see more than a triple integral. It does come up, um, but geometrically, it never, ha like, it doesn't mean anything geometrically. Um, but there are applications out there where you have functions of more than just uh, three variables. Um, in my work, again, for those who don't know, back in my, back in the day, when I was a wee lad, I uh, studied oceanography, and I was looking at how tides move sediment. And I routinely dealt with things that were functions of at least six variables, right? Because you have like the, the three positions, um, but then you have other things due to rotation and this, that, and the other stuff. And so um, we ran into those a lot, but those weren't functions that we could ever map or draw, right? Because we're restricted to three dimensions. Um, you can get away with it though, with things like contour lines on top of it, um, or colors and things like that. Like think about a weather map. Weather map's really good about showing way more than just two variables, right? They'll show you winds with little arrows. They'll show you temperatures with color. They'll show you pressures with um, contour lines, right? So there's another one where they'll show you at least five real easily. But anyway, I digress. Most of the time, triple integrals where we're gonna cut it off. So in our class, we're not gonna go beyond triples. Okay, that's where we're going to cut it off. All right, so then the question is, we've got more than one of these differentials. In which order do we do them? And it's really natural for us to go, well, clearly we must go left or right, because that's how we do things. But you also know in math, there are plenty of times we do right to left, right? Like think about composition, for example. So um, when it comes to which of these do we do, it is what you want to do. It is left to right. So the first one that you're going to integrate with respect to is the first one that you run into from left to right. And then you continue. So for example, that first one I've got, we're going to integrate first with respect to y and then with respect to x. The second one we're going to do first with respect to z, then x, then y. And to help you see that, you can really see why this is, if you were to think about writing this out with like parentheses, right? This is telling me I want to do two integrals. I want to do an integral and then I want to integrate the integral I just did. So imagine I just put parentheses right here. This is an integral with respect to y. And then once that's done, I integrate it with respect to x. And the same kind of thing can be seen down here. <coughs> Excuse me. There's my integral with respect to z. Then I integrate that with respect to x. And then I integrate that with respect to y. <coughs> All right, oh, hold on a second, guys. I need to pause. You good? Yep, I'm good. Thank you. All right, so again, we're working inside out which is pretty standard, right? We're working inside out, read it left to right. Okay, so hopefully we're good with how we can tell what we're gonna integrate with respect to. Now, iterated integrals, 99% plus of the time are definite integrals where we actually have bounds on them so let me show you what those bounds would have to look like for one of these double or triple integrals. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and integrate some function x, y of x, y. And let's do dy, dx, kind of like I had written first. So think about what we're going to have here. These inside bounds, those apply to the dy. And what we know about those 
is that they are going to be constant with respect to y, which means they can be x's. So what I'm going to write for my bounds here, I'm going to write g sub 1 of x. And for the upper bound, I'm going to put g sub 2 of x. <clears throat> so those are just going to be functions of x. Because they're functions of x, they're constants with respect to y which is totally appropriate for what we were talking about before. All right, so, cool. So now think about these outside bounds. Those have to be constants, and they have to be constants with respect to x. So you might be thinking, oh, okay, so we're gonna have functions of y, but nope, we're not. <clears throat> These are going to be just plain old numbers, A and B. And it's usually at about this time that someone goes, whoa, 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 why do those have to be constant constants? Why can't they be variables of X? Because, or I mean, variables, of, uh, functions of Y, because those are constant with respect to X. And here's the reason. Think about when I integrate with respect to y. So whatever, I integrate with respect to y. And then I put in bounds. Where do those bounds go? What do you plug those into? Y. They go into the y's. So the y's are gone. Those y's are now all in terms of x. So as soon as we do this first integral, what we're left with is a single variable function, a function that's only x, which means that integral is the integral you know and love, the integrals that you learned almost a year ago, or longer if you're coming back after a while, right? But when you first learn integrals, that's what we have now. And so for a single variable integral, these have to be bound. And so what would change if we switch the order on this, right, if this was f of x, y, but we wrote, say, dx, dy, these inner ones are now functions of y. So you're going to have g1 of y and g2 of y. And again, you have some bounds here, A and B, but the difference is this time, these are Y values. The A and the B here are X values. Because they correspond to that last differential. All right. I'm not going to bother showing you a triple integral yet. We'll get there. Um, instead, let's actually try some double integrals. Let's go through the process so you can see how it works and how we can end up with the answer, right, when we get everything, when everything's said and done. <clears throat> All right, so here's an example. Let's say we're going to do a double integral. And let's just go easy. Let's call this one x squared y. We'll do a dy dx. And let's say that the bounds are from square root of x to x on the inner one. And on the outer one, let's go 0 to 1. <clears throat> So the outer bounds are constants, and the inner bounds, as long as they don't have y's, they're perfectly appropriate. All right. So we're still going to integral from 0 to 1. We'll worry about that later. But let's start with integrating with respect to y. So x squared y is going to give us x squared y squared over 2. 
that we're now going to evaluate at the bounds of square root of x and x. So basically all this stuff was that first integral. So the first of the two that we're iterating, there it is. Okay, well now let's plug in our x's. Let's plug in our bounds, all right? So we're gonna put those in for y. So this is gonna leave us then the integral from zero to one of x to the fourth over two minus x cubed over two. And I think at this point you can see why now we have to have just constant constants because this is only a function of x. All the y's are gone. So it's a single variable integral like you're used to. So now we integrate that thing. We get x to the fifth over 10 minus x to the fourth over eight that we then evaluate at zero and one. And that gives us one tenth minus one eighth. And what is that, minus 1 40th, I think. <clears throat> so when everything is said and done with this iterated integral, we end up with negative 1 over 40. So when you do one of these iterated integrals, that's a definite integral, you're going to end up with a number just like before, right? When you had definite integral before, you just got a number. Same thing's gonna happen here. We'll talk about what this number means in a second, but this is the process. You won't always see variables on these bounds. Sometimes they are just numbers. Like, let, we'll, we'll do a triple integral here, but we'll do an easy triple integral. Let's try this one. <clears throat> We're gonna integrate x, y, z. Let's go dy, dz, dx. So let's say that the bounds on this are zero to one, one to x, and then zero to two. All right, so again, think about how we read this. We're gonna start integrating with respect to y. So those innermost bounds have to be constants with respect to y. So they could have had x's, they could have had z's. They don't, but they're still constants with respect to y. All right, so let's see what we get when we integrate that. That's gonna give us x, y squared, z over two at zero and one. So I plug in for y. So what I'm gonna get is x z over two minus zero, so that's it. And then we're left with dz dx. So now let's move into the next integral. So we're gonna integrate with respect to z, which means these bounds have to be constant with respect to z, which they are. The x is fine, because x is not z, it's constant. So we're gonna integrate from one to x. All right, well, let's do that integral. This is gonna give us x z squared over four that we're gonna evaluate at one and x. So that's gonna give us x cubed over four minus x over four. Again, we're plugging in for the z.
but now we're golden. This is just a function of one variable. We know exactly what to do. So integrating that first one gives us x to the fourth. The second one gives us minus x squared over eight. Evaluated at zero and two, we get four minus a half. The zeros, of course, give a zero. So this one ends up being seven halves. So just because we have lots of integrals doesn't make this hard. We're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over. We're iterating it, right? So we're just doing the same thing. Um, we just have to be really careful, pay attention to our bounds and pay attention to what the variable is. Which one's variable and which ones are constant. But you can't fail. Just work your way inside out. Work your way from left to right. You'll always know what your variable is. But that's where the majority of your mistakes are going to come, especially early on. You're going to integrate with respect to the wrong thing. You're going to plug the bounds into the wrong letters. Right? Like th those are going to be the mistakes. Um, so just go slow and watch yourself. Um, I have a question. Go for it, Beth. For that last integral, shouldn't oh. it be x to the fourth divided by 16? <clears throat> I mean, I guess. Minus. Yeah. If you want to get all like technical and stuff. Okay. I just, I thought I was losing my mind for a sec. I'm sorry. No, no, you're all good. That was just me brain farting. So I guess that changes that to what? One minus one half. No, thank you. It's, just, it's been a long day. I teach calc in the morning starting at 8.30. So. Ew. Yeah, by this point, I, I start to get a little calced out. So. Anyway, thanks for that catch, though. I appreciate it. All right, so okay-ish. Maybe we'll get the kind of the same statements as before, right? Like when, when James was like, he's optimistic, right? Are we still optimistic about this? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I'm optimistic about this. <laughs> All right, so, and, and I do, you know, um, I got to tell you, Jordan, that I do feel for you terribly when you say you, you haven't seen the partials. Um, I feel for you because without a pretty good understanding of how partials work, partial derivatives, trying to do partial integrals, it's kind of like if I had said, hey, integrate, but you've never seen derivatives. Um, so, Try to work on that sooner rather than later and definitely come find me in an office hour or something. We can get together and chat because um, I want to get you up to speed. All right, because I, I don't want that to be what's limiting you here. Um, do you, could you remind me what the difference is between implicitly differentiating and partially differentiating? Sure. So the, the partial, you're good with what partial derivatives are. Yeah. For the, how does implicit work? Mm -hmm. Okay, so implicit was the good old, like when you had something like x squared plus y squared equals 16. And instead of trying to solve it for y and then differentiating, what you did instead was you just differentiated both sides with respect to x. And so this gave you 2x plus 2y times y prime equals 0. Um, and this one was implicit differentiation, not partial differentiation. Because notice, when I differentiated here, I was differentiating with respect to x, but y was not treated as a constant. Instead, y is treated as a function. I just don't know what it is. And because it's a function, I have to use the chain rule. Right? This 2y times y prime is chain rule on that. 
the y squared gave me the 2y, and then I have to multiply by the derivative of what's inside. I don't know what it is because I don't know what function y is. Right? It's implied that it's a function, I just don't know what it is. And so that's the difference. With partial derivatives, those other letters are constants. With implicit differentiation, that other letter is an unknown function. All right. Right, and differentiating constants does something completely different than differentiating a function, even mm -hmm. if it's unknown. Okay. All right, so is that a little bit better there? Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right, so any other questions at this point? All right, so I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna answer a question I know that Victor's got. He's got, because he always asks this question. So it's probably sitting in his head. So I'm, I'm gonna anticipate it and I'm gonna answer it for you. Um, and, and that is, what the hell is this geometrically? What are we adding up, right? What is this telling us? Um, I know he asked this question because he asked me that about the, uh, uh, just the partial integral. But with these, with the double integral, and again, we're gonna just, we're gonna stay with double integrals for a while. We'll get to triple integrals later, but that's one of those things. We might as well learn how to swim in the shallow end, then go into the deep end, right? Um, <clears throat> so with a double integral, here's what's going on. You remember integrals when we first showed them to you. We told you that we are basically finding the area under a curve, right? So like just a single integral going from A to B of f of x, dx. You saw some variation of this picture. Right, and then the integral was actually giving us this area. Right, so you saw some variation of that when you first learned integration. And um, to show you how this did that, we did the whole rectangle approach. You break this area into a bunch of rectangles and add them up. So you saw a picture that looked kind of like this at one point. And the idea was that if you add up the area of all those rectangles, it's close to the actual area. And of course, the way that we made that better was to make more rectangles that were thinner, that had smaller width. And then eventually we just went to, well, let's have an infant number of infinitesimally thin rectangles. And that gave us our area, right? And I just want you to notice geometrically what was going on here. The dx, that was really coming from the width here, because we called that delta x. And then we were getting the height. So I'm going to write here f of x, let me do it out here so you can see it better, f of x sub i, <clears throat> and the i just told you, okay, that's going to be in the ith rectangle, so x sub 10 was a height that came from the 10th rectangle, and so on. And so if you want the area of one of these things, it's base times width, right, or base times height, width times height, however you want to think about it. Well, that's what this is. This was the height, the f of x was the height, and the dx was the width. So you multiply those together, you had a sum of that, right? Going from one to n, and then we did a limit, and we just said, okay, let n go to infinity. And the next thing you know, hey, there's our integral. So that's how we built it for one variable. So hopefully you at least have a recollection of this. If it's not 100% for you, don't worry about it. I just kind of wanted to draw the picture to get it back in mind to help you see what's going on when we go to two variables. 
So let's do that. Let's go to two variables. Let's look at a double integral. We're now going to have a function of two variables, so f of x, y. We'll go ahead and set it up as a dy dx at first. So that means that I've got bounds on the inside that are potential functions of x. And then on the outside, they're just a and b. OK, so let's kind of break this down and think about what we're doing. Well, if we think of it as multiplication, we're taking this function of two variables. We're multiplying it by a dy and also by a dx. So dy and dx are little lengths. Their length in the x direction and in the y direction. If I multiply those together, I get an area in the xy plane. So think about this is just our xy plane. So somewhere over here is a delta x, and then there's a delta y. So dy times dx, or delta y times delta x, is going to give me the area of a rectangle. And then I'm multiplying it by the function value. All right, well, when it's a multivariable function, remember now we're in three dimensions, so that whatever this is, the result, tells us where to go in the z direction, so in or out of the board. So we've got some surface out here. We're basically running from this area on the whiteboard, on the plane, out to that surface. So I'm, I've got this rectangle times a distance out. So what am I actually getting there? What is that geometric thing? A volume? Yeah. It's a volume of a box. So when you multiply this together, you're basically getting the volume of a little rectangular box. That's really eerie how close that was to actually being the size of the box I drew, the size of my eraser here. But think of this eraser, right? It's three dimensions. It's a three-dimensional rectangular box. That technically, it's what we, it's called a rectangular parallelopiped. We're going to call it a box, right? We're finding the volume of that box. Okay, so then what do you think this the double integralness does? Instead of finding area, you get volume. Yeah, it's giving us volume because it's going to take this one. And it's going to add it to the volume of this box, and 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 this box. And, this box. and then the integral this just says, well, keep making these boxes smaller and smaller and smaller until you have an infinite number of them. Add them all up. OK, so what this is going to give us geometrically This is going to be the volume under the surface created by f of x, y. So whatever this equation is, it gives us some surface in space. This is finding us the volume under that surface over some region. And that region R is going to be defined by the bounds. So in physics right now, we're, we were talking about Gauss's law uh -huh. and uh, Gaussian surfaces and stuff like that. 
Okay. This is essentially that, right? It's not double integral. So um, you use multiple integrals there in lots of different ways. Like, um, for example, if you wanted to find, say, the charge on the surface, you could use double integrals. Um, because basically you're you're adding up the charge on the surface in all kinds of different places, right? And and that surface does extend really, it's a two-dimensional surface in a 3D space. Um, so you could use that there if you were going to be looking at, say, the volume inside of that surface, you would definitely use double integrals. So um, double integrals are really going to be used anytime you want to add something up that uh, has two dimensions. Right? Like this one, I know it ends up being a three-dimensional quantity. It ends up being volume, but it's coming from a two-dimensional region. Just like when you found areas, that area was coming from a one-dimensional interval. I don't know if you ever thought about it that way, but when we specified this back in the day and you were finding that you know, area under the curve, you were saying, what's the area under that curve over an interval, over a one-dimensional stretch? Well, this is what we're doing now. We're going to say, well, what's the volume under the surface over this two-dimensional region? Right? Because I may not want to know the entire volume under something, but I only want to know the volume that's above a certain region. Like you can imagine an application of that would be, let's say we're, we're building, you know, constructing a building or something, and you've got the roof and whatnot, and you want to know, okay, well, it's actually the volume of the space inside for heating issues and all that. Well, I don't care about the part of the roof that goes outside over the patio. Don't care about that. I want to restrict myself to the region over which the volume matters, right? So it, it's just, we're extending it out. We're taking a two-dimensional region now, and we're adding up this function over that two-dimensional region. And by doing that, it then gives us volume. Wild. So any application you can think of where you've got two variables and you want to add stuff up, that's where a double integral is going to be useful. And so then by extension, a triple integral, that's going to be useful in a scenario where you've got three variables and you want to add that thing up. All right, so some more physics examples. Um, like, let's say you're going to talk about, um, well, okay, so like you're talking about the charge and think about the charge on a surface. Well, imagine breaking that surface up into little tiny surface chunks, right? Like little um, squares on a quilt or something, right? Well, you find the charge on this little square, or it doesn't have to be a square, right? On this portion. And then find the charge on this portion, and this portion, and this portion, and this portion, and this portion. And you do that over the entirety of the surface. You add it all up, you now have total charge. Um, another example with electricity is flux. I don't know if you guys have talked about flux yet, but that's, you know, going through the surface. Yeah. Um, same kind of thing. Uh, if you go to like the water flow idea for, for me, think of like a cross-sectional uh, slice of a tidal channel or a creek or a river, right? And water's flowing through there. Each portion of that has a different flow rate. Not all of it moves at the same speed. That's why you get eddies and rapids and things like that, right? Okay, well, if I were to look at this little chunk of cross section, there's a speed, a velocity, so I can figure out how much water is passing through that at a given time. And then I do that with this one and this one and this one, and then I go to the higher level, higher level, higher level. And I do that all the way over my cross section, then a double integral would allow me to calculate total flow through that surface, through that cross section. So that at that one slice, I can tell you how much water is flowing by. 
right? So, uh, th I mean, the uses of this are endless. As long as you can think of an example where you've got a function based on two variables and you want to add it up, whatever that it is, that's where you use a double integral. And then the same for triple. Um, but then it also starts showing you why we don't really care about those with like four and five and six, because those are less and less common. And they get so much co more complicated that we often can approximate with something easier. I mean, you guys are totally used to that now, where we go, well, okay, I know the reality is there's air resistance, but let's not do it right now because then it makes the math easy, right? We, we do that all the time. But then, of course, the next step is, well, let's add in the air resistance. Let's add in these other variables. And we're now developing those tools where we're not limited anymore. And you can go, you know what would be better? Is if we included temperature in this. Okay, let's figure out how temperature affects things. Let's throw it in there. All right, well, now we can differentiate and integrate with respect to T for temperature and, you know, and go. So it's kind of nice that you guys are getting to that point now where you're getting the tools and you're seeing how you can apply them to the next step. Anyway, uh, so while I was babbling, hold on, Jacob just wrote, what about volumes of closed 3D shapes? Yeah, we'll do the same thing. We can actually use double integrals for that as well. Um, think about it this way. I gave you, let's go back to the one variable. I gave you this picture. What if I wanted a closed 2D shape? So closed would mean something like that. And I ask you, what's the area of that shape? Could you do that with a single variable integral? I don't think yeah, so. you just you did subtraction, right? If you could describe the top, say, as F, and the bottom as G, this is just an integral of F minus G, right? And A and B were whatever the values where it ended up. Okay, so how do you think we would do it if we wanted to find the volume of a closed 3D surface? Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. It's just now we're going to have a function of X and Y that describes the top, a function of X and Y that describes the bottom. And so you'd have a double integral of f of xy minus g of xy over whatever region we are interested in. This is another beautiful thing about it, is that as we bump up in dimension, as we extend this, we don't actually do anything different. It's still top minus bottom. Just we have to define top and we have to define bottom. We're good to go. So we're not having to do anything really different, but it is more complicated. It absolutely is more complicated because just go to that example. It's a lot harder to find a function, a two variable function that describes a surface than it is to find a one variable function that describes a curve. Right. The other thing that's out there that we haven't gotten to yet is I mentioned that it's going to be over some region defined by the bounds. That's going to be a challenge too. We're going to have to figure out how do we actually describe that region so that we can put it in here as our bounds. So because I'm a straight shooter with you guys, because I don't, you know, blow smoke, I want to be upfront and honest. Yeah, I'm talking about how this is beautiful because it's the same thing. Doesn't mean it's easy. This is going to be a challenge, especially when we get to three variables. When we get to three variables, trying to picture, because now we're going to be integrating over space, right? One variable, you're integrating over an interval. Two variables, you're integrating over a region. Three variables, you're integrating over a three dimensional solid, basically. Trying to picture that is difficult. 
So we're definitely going to have to work at that. But once we get it, once we get the bounds, once we have it set up properly, this is going to be no big deal because it's just like any integration you've ever done. So if you don't have trouble with integration, you won't have trouble with double integration once the bounds are put into place. Creating the bounds will require work, but then once we're there, we're good. Um, so you okay, know how... So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you know how sometimes we can use a power series to integrate a function that we didn't know how to integrate before? Can you still yeah. do that multiple times? Um, kind of, kind, kind of, because think about power series. Power series are for functions of one variable and they don't really extend to two variables that well. I mean, you can do a similar process, but you very rarely do. Um, more what we do, actually, let, let me show you. Uh, let me show you with an example of where, um, you can get around having a function that you don't know how to integrate if you do it the right way. Okay, so, so uh, but before I get there, let me talk a little bit about how these bounds determine your region. So I, I will, I think I'll get to that kind of um, Bradley, but long story short, nobody ever does it. Not nobody, but it's rare that it's done, and there are usually other ways that you can get around it. I'm good with that. <laughs> Anything to keep you away from power series? Yeah. <clears throat> Riley, are, are, am I, were you thinking about being a math major? Physics. Physics, okay. For some reason, I thought you were thinking about being a math major. Um, because math major, anybody who is thinking about being a math major, get to know power series because they are your friend. Oh my God. And, and even in, in the sciences, because if you just take the first couple terms of a power series, that's usually plenty for anything you're doing and they can be pretty quick and easy. But I, I don't want to get preaching on the values of power series. All right. Um, but let me show you how these bounds play out. All right. So, um, let me set one up just generically. So we'll do a dy dx. I'll also show you what it means dx dy. So this is just like you've seen me write a few times now. Um, so we've got g1 of x and g2 of x as the bounds on y, and then a and b as the bounds on x. So geometrically, what this is doing, there are two functions, g1 and g2. So let's say that this is g1 and this is g2. Similarly, there are bounds on x. Remember that these guys are x's because they are the outermost variable, so they're x's. So that also means that there's somewhere here x equals a and x equals b. And so the region that we would be integrating over here, if I can actually draw a line that's somewhat vertical, Jesus. I'll take that, that's a little bit better. This is the region over which we're integrating. And I'm gonna call this region big R. So this is gonna be kind of standard. If I write big R, that just means the region, the two-dimensional region over which our double integral is being applied. So notice how this works. The G1 and G2, those are our lower and upper bounds. And those are our lower and upper bounds in terms of Y. So those are literally up and down. And then the A and the B, those are our x's, so those are our left and right bounds. So f is not on this picture. This picture has nothing to do with f whatsoever. It is only a picture of the region defined by the bounds. 
because f of x, y is some surface out here. And it could change. It could be a plane. It could be a tilted plane. It could be some sort of wavy thing. It could be, uh, you know, the top half of a hyperboloid of two sheets. Or, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Doesn't really matter. But this picture right here, you need to think about it a little bit differently. This is a picture of the region that's determined by the bounds. So if you're ever in just bounds and you want to figure out the region, draw the picture. Draw these functions of y, figure out n b, and literally draw out this picture. Now, if we were to turn it around, so that instead of having a dyx, we had a dx dy. So again, we'll call them g1 of x, and, or sorry, g1 of y, and g2 of y. And again, A and B. I have to draw you a different paper. Because now G1 and G2 are functions that like this. So that would be G1 of Y and G Y. Hopefully you remember having to kind of turn your view sideways when you did some integrals when you did it with a dy instead of a dx, or sorry, dx instead of a dy. No, dy instead of dx. But you kind of had to turn yourself sideways. Well, that's the same kind of thing here. Um, again, these are in the x direction, lowermost x, uppermost x. Well, lowermost x is to the left, uppermost is to the right. And then there are a's and b's. Okay, well, so choose two of them. And again, these are y values, right? These are y equal a and y equal b. So there's y equal a. Here's y equal b. And so this region is kind of this anvil looking region. And again, this has nothing to do with the function that we're integrating. Nothing whatsoever. This is just telling us, okay, now that the function's out here, this is where we're going to be calculating. All right, so this is going to be the struggle, no doubt, is trying to create these things so that we've got our correct bounds. So let's do this. Let's actually look at an integral. And what we'll do is we'll see if we can draw the picture. And then we'll see if we can actually switch it, switch the order of integration, just to see um, if we can get the same region, but looking the other way. All right, so let's do this. Let's do the double integral of e to the x squared we'll have a dy dx let's let our y's go from 0 to x and then from 0 to 1 And some of you, when I wrote this, might have started going, oh, I don't like this integral. Because what's the integral of e to the x squared? I'm sure Larry has shown me something weird. Um, it's not something, something impossible. You can't do it. You cannot integrate e to the x squared dx. It's impossible. All right. So um, you might have seen that and known oh, something funky's going on. Don't let it go. Turns out it'll be okay. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and calculate it. So remember what we're going to do first. 
we're going to integrate with respect to y. So that means that all of this stuff is constant. So we're going to get e to the x squared. And when you integrate a constant, you just multiply by the variable. So the integral of e to the x squared is e to the x squared times y. Now let's put in our bounds. So I put in x. Okay, we've got x e to the x squared. When I plug in 0, that just gives me 0. And so now I need to integrate x e to the x squared. And this one you can do with a u substitution. If you let u equal x squared, du is 2x, all that good stuff, what you're going to get is 1 half e to the x squared. So we evaluate those at 1 and 0. And so you get 1 half e minus 1 half. Okay, so th there was the answer to this, but let's look at this geometrically. Let's think about what does this number actually mean? All right, well, let's draw the region. So here's what I want you to think about. These guys, these inner ones, these are y's, right? These are y equals 0 and y equals x. So on the axis, let's draw y equals 0 and y equals x. So here's y equals 0, and here's y equals x. And y equals x is the top, y equals 0 is the bottom. All right, so now let's look at these outermost. The outermost are x's x equals 0 to x equals 1. So the region over which we're integrating is this triangle right here. So if you want to try to picture the region, this is how you do it. So we've got the function e to the x squared, right? It's somewhere out here. And we're basically saying, OK, take this triangular piece and extend it out until you run into the surface. I also like to think of it, you'll hear me say, take a cookie cutter and slice through. So I imagine I've got this triangular cookie cutter, and I just slice down in. And I look, OK, what's that volume that still remains? Well, that would be 1 half e minus 1 half. What that is, it's like 0.86 or something like that, 85. Um, but that would be this value. OK, now, it turns out that we could have, instead of doing this vertically, we could have done it horizontally. And let me show you what this double integral would have looked like if we had turned it around. So we're still going to have our e to the x squared, but now let's do dx dy. So in this case, we have to think sideways instead of vertically, right? When we did it this way, basically what we were doing is we said, let's go up and down, and then work our way all the way across, right? So starting with these small verticals and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, now what we want to do is turn ourselves sideways. So we're looking at these lengths and then working our way up. OK, so to help you with this, I need to introduce you to somebody. Um, he's a mathematical superhero. And I do, I mean, like, superhero, like, 
Captain America, Iron Man, right? Like he's stronger than all the Avengers together. Like he could have single-handedly beat Thanos, I'm just saying. All right, and his name is Integrate Man. So integration man is going to be your friend when you're trying to calculate these things and trying to figure out the regions. Now here's how integration man works. Integration man is a little bit like um, uh, like Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four. If you don't know who he is, he he can stretch, right? Like he can make his arms stretch really long. He can bend his body into weird shapes. Well, that's what integration man can do. And integration man in this realm can change his height. He can stretch himself so that he's taller or shorter. And so what integration man does is he basically will map out your region if you do this. The upper bound. This is where his head is going to be. So let me just go to like a generic double integral. Right? His head is going to be the upper bound of the inner integral. His feet are at the lower bound. So think about this one that we just set up. His head is at y equal x, and his feet are at y equals 0. Da -da -da -da, integration man. OK, so there's integration man. Now, what Integration Man does is then he walks along a region or an interval. And that's what the outer bounds tell you, right? So Integration Man is going to start here at zero. So he starts infinitesimally small. He's like Ant-Man when Ant-Man goes into the quantum universe. And as he starts walking, he starts getting taller. But his head is always on that top function, and his feet are always at the bottom function. But as he walks from 0 to 1, notice that he fills in this region. All right, so there's integration man for our original function, or for our original integral. Now. As soon as we go dx dy, we just made integration man turn on his side. He's now going to go in the x direction. He still has the same superpower. He still is going to change his height. It's just his height is going to change as he walks in the other direction, as he walks up and down. So let me give you a couple of pictures of integration man. So when he's down here at the x-axis, he's tallest. And as he moves upward, he gets shorter. Right? But eventually, once we have enough copies of him as he works his way, we start filling in the same region. All right, so now my question is, where is his head? In this region, what line, what curve defines his head? Y equals zero. Not y equals zero. Right, his head's out here. Always on that vertical line. No, x equals right. one. It's x equals one. So since now that we saw these, these are gonna have to be x bounds first and then y bounds. So his head is at x equals 1. All right, so where are his feet? What curve? y equals x. OK, so it's at y equals x. But we want it as x equals. So what does x equal? Y. And y, yeah, y equals x, then x equals y. So the bounds for him sideways are going to be y to 1. So his feet are always on x equals y, 
and his head is always on x equals one. All right, so now we need to specify over which y values does he walk. Well, he starts at y equals zero, and he's gonna keep going until he reaches this point right here. What y is that? One. It's one, because if we're on y equals x, then when x is one, y is one. So the bounds there are gonna be zero to one. So this integral right here, the integral from zero to one, y to one of e to the x squared dx dy is exactly the same, will give us exactly the same value as the one we started with. We just turn ourselves sideways in order to build this region. All right, we're gonna do lots more of this, don't worry. We're, we're out of time for today. But we're going to do a lot of this. We're going to practice a lot with the switching the order of integration because sometimes you can integrate it and sometimes you can't. Like this one, the way that we just wrote this, is one that's impossible to integrate because we're going to have to integrate e to the x squared with respect to x, and we can't do that. But if we were to swap the bounds, it turns into one that's no problem. So we will practice this. You will get familiar with integration man. Trust me. You're gonna like integration man. Integration man is really, really useful. Wait till we get to polar. And then integration man is fun because he can like bend himself over like a rainbow and things like that. So um, we're gonna see integration man a lot. Um, and uh, just so you know, it is a Bruceism. Like I created integration man, but it's not independent. All right, like I'm not the only one because I know Larry also created Integration Man separately. We just got chatting one day and he's like, wait a minute, I do the same thing. So Integration Man is around. A lot of people know about him, um, but you'll never see him in a textbook, right? It's kind of like Superman. A lot of people know Clark Kent. Nobody knows, you know, nobody finds Superman. Same thing, right? Um, anyway, so. We will talk more about this next time, but I do want to remind you that we do have a quiz on Friday, right? So our next quiz, so we're going to do the same thing we did before, which is start that quiz. Um, I'll open it up at one o'clock and you'll have until 1.40 to get it all done and turned in and uploaded. And then we'll start class at 1.40. And this quiz, um, it's going to cover, uh, let's see, it's going to be on the, integration of vector value functions, right? So like that section, and then also the applied section. So accelerates, accelerates, <laughs> accelerations, velocities, um, and the like. So I, I don't remember what section numbers those were, but I think they're the last two sections um, in class. So uh, that's what the this quiz will cover, all right? Okay, so with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this recording.